in the long history of conflict at sea, capturing your enemy's warships and using them in your own fleet has been a common practice. It became so common during the Age of Sail that quite a few names in the Royal Navy, as an example, exist entirely because they originated with foreign ships, captured and put into service as war prizes. However, in the 20th century, the practice began to fall out of favor. Not only were fewer warships captured in general, those that were captured were far more complex. It is simpler to slap some new masts and sails on a captured ship than to keep turbines built by another country in service, or supply ammunition for guns of a completely different design than your own. Not to say it didn't happen, Japan was quite fond of it, but it was still far less common. This is what makes the story of HMS Graf, or U-570 as she was launched, so interesting. Here you have a U-boat captured on her first voyage and put into service by the Royal Navy. In fact, she served multiple patrols under the British flag, so it wasn't simply a testing phase. Other U-boats would be captured, most famously U-505, but they weren't pressed into service like this. That is something you need to graph and worth taking a look at. Though this won't be a terribly exciting service history, hopefully it will at least be an interesting one. Right. U-570, a Type 7C U-boat, was laid down on May 21st, 1940. Launched on March 20th, 1941, and commissioned on May 15th of the same year, she was just one of many, many, many submarines in her class. Equipped with five 21-inch torpedo tubes, four in the bow and one in the stern, these were heavily armed submarines for their size. With up to 14 torpedoes aboard, along with the 88mm deck gun, the Type 7, of which 703 were completed, was the menace of Atlantic shipping in the early war. Capable of 17 or so knots on the surface, they could easily keep pace with most freighters. While their 7.6 knot submerged speed wasn't near as fast, it was still perfectly sufficient to keep them a serious threat to Allied shipping. This is, of course, the class as a whole. U-570 has the same equipment and statistics, but she would end up proving to be anything but a menace to Allied shipping. Following her commissioning in May, the U-Bo would begin her working up and training period. This saw her sail through the Baltic and then around Norway, and would end up lasting until August of 1941. It was at this point that she was sent out into the Atlantic to hunt around Iceland, one of many U-boats sent on this task at that time. So it was, on August 24th, U-570 set out on her first war patrol. Her only war patrol under the German flag. This patrol would be short and something of a mess, evidently going wrong from the start as an inexperienced crew wrestled with the incredibly difficult task of running a submarine in the 1940s. Just to list the technical issues and ignoring the crew problems for the moment. She apparently had, in order, a malfunctioning air compressor, diesel engines that weren't properly tuned and caused unpleasant vibrations, which probably contributes to something I will mention later. And finally, she had busted hydrophones knocked out of action after she bottomed out heading to Norway. This set of technical issues would have been problematic with an experienced crew. U-570 notably did not have an experienced crew. Her commanding officer, Hans Romlow, was an experienced naval officer, true enough, but his experience was in different areas. While he had commanded U-58, a training submarine, that was hardly on wartime patrols in the Atlantic. The other officers were hardly better. The British report on the crew describes the first lieutenant, as an example, as being an uninteresting, arrogant young man, who evidently was considered by the crew to be neither efficient or knowledgeable. This man would later be shot attempting to escape from a POW camp, though the exact details are... conflicted between sources. Only the engineer had any real U-boat experience, which makes him one of only four men, period, who had actually served on an active war patrol. The rest of the crew ranged from brand new to transfers from other branches who were also inexperienced. The result would be a mess made worse when they ended up getting seasick, probably not helped by the diesels as mentioned earlier. 
While the submarine spent most of her time on the surface, which gave the crew some respite, she was forced to submerge on August 27th when a Lockheed Hudson attacked her. This particular plane failed to release its depth charges, but by forcing the submarine to submerge, it made the seasickness issue worse. Nothing is quite like being stuck in a tight metal tube, breathing in the usual submarine fumes on top of the results of a bunch of seasick men. As such, Ronlo ordered the submarine surfaced to give the crew a bit of fresh air at around 10.50 that morning. All well and good. Until you realize he managed to surface quite literally right beneath a second Hudson that had been called in by the first. This plane had functional bomb racks and would promptly drop four depth charges around U-570 as her captain frantically ordered a crash dive. While the depth charges didn't do substantial damage to the submarine, they did panic the crew. The Germans, inexperienced as they were, did not cope well with what damage was done. It had rolled U-570 almost completely over, knocked out the submarine's electrical power, and smashed instruments. This was enough of an issue for an inexperienced crew, but the depth charging had also caused some water leaks and contaminated the air aboard the U-boat. The crew, not knowing any better and quite rattled, thought this was chlorine gas. Which, for the record, when water entered a submarine back then and came in contact with the batteries, it would produce chlorine and quite possibly kill the crew that way. This meant that when the inexperienced engineering crew thought they were going to suffocate, they promptly fled their compartment. This was sealed off, which had the side effect of preventing the crew from restoring power. Romlo was now convinced his crew would suffocate if they remained below the waves, on top of lacking instruments to judge how deep the U-boat was diving. So he promptly ordered the submarine brought back to the surface, not long after the water settled from the depth charges. Now on the surface, in seas so rough they couldn't possibly man their anti-aircraft gun, the U-boat's crew brought out a white flag, or white shirts in lack of a proper white flag. After the ten or so men who first exited the submarine were strafed by the Hudson's gunners, mind you, because they didn't know the submarine was surrendering. With the submarine clearly not intending to fight, the Hudson proceeded to circle and keep an eye on U-570. More aircraft would soon arrive, including another Hudson with more depth charges and a PBY Catalina. These aircraft would hover around the submarine, a very visible threat that trying to run or fight would end poorly, let's say. Meanwhile, aboard U-570, the crew smashed their Enigma machine and threw it overboard, along with any important documents not before using their radio to call, in the open, for help from any German forces. This would prompt other U-boats to try and reach U-570, though none would make it. For their part, the British intercepted this transmission. Eager to capture an intact U-boat, for obvious reasons, they scrambled every nearby ship to the area. The aircraft would continue to monitor the situation in the meantime, until fuel issues forced the Hudson's home. That Catalina, meanwhile, would remain over the U-boat for a grand total of 13 hours before an anti-submarine trawler, Northern Chief, arrived. Over the course of the night, several other ships showed up. These included HMS Burl and HMCS Niagara, both of which were ex-USN four-stacker destroyers. A series of continued misadventures, featuring a Norwegian patrol aircraft attacking U-570 without knowing she was surrendered, occurred after this. It was only after that plane was waved off, and after a machine gun wounded five of the German crew, that a tow line was rigged up. With constant air cover and the German crew taken aboard the British ships, U-570 was towed to Iceland. She would arrive in a town I'm not even going to try pronouncing on August 29th, where she was promptly beached to prevent her from sinking. The British were, understandably, quick to get people aboard to examine their new prize after this. While not the first U-boat captured, she was the first to make it back to port in one piece. That I'm aware of, anyway. After digging through a terrible mess aboard the U-boat, the British team would restore power and buoyancy. U-570, past the risk of sinking if nothing else, was towed out to another Icelandic port at that point. Here she would be docked along a depot ship, and more properly examined. This found that the submarine was actually at no real risk of sinking to begin with. The depth charging had cracked some of her batteries and buckled her bow, but leaks were generally confined to her ballast and fuel tanks. 
there was no chlorine gas aboard, and while the gauges were broken, it was the opinion of the British that an experienced crew could have easily fixed things and evaded further attack. Lucky for them that U-570 lacked that. In fact, even attempts at destroying valuable equipment and documents were less than successful on the German end. While the Enigma had been lost, the British still pulled out important documents and books, including the Commander's Handbook. These would prove quite useful for the never-ending effort to break German communications. The real intelligence coup here would be U-570 herself, however. After three weeks in Iceland, the U-boat was prepared to sail to Britain. Before this, though, two American naval officers would inspect her between the 23rd and 26th of September. The report they prepared will, along with the British equivalents, be linked in the description. After these officers were done examining the submarine, and given one of her G-7A torpedoes, the U-boat set out for Britain on September 29th. Forced to sail on the surface due to damage to her dive planes during the beaching, U-570 arrived in the UK on October 3rd. This was turned into something of a publicity circus, with cameras filming her arrival and the press reporting on it in the papers. To the point her capture was turned into propaganda, in fact, which is quite unlike the secrecy revolving around other captured U-boats. Understandable, really, because it would have been incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to hide the fact, not with so many ships and planes involved in capturing her. It was impossible to hide the effort that went into securing her, so might as well rub it into the Kriegsmarine's face. In any case, U-570 was placed in dry dock for proper repairs at this point. This was a difficult process, as men worked in and around an unfamiliar submarine. It was made more difficult by the depth charge damage, which had evidently trapped four torpedoes in the tubes, which required cutting them out and disarming them. I do not envy the poor saps who had to do that particular task. It was done, though, and repairs continued while U-570's ultimate fate remained something up in the air. Among other things, Churchill apparently wanted to hand her over to the Americans, for propaganda value, and to make them even more British-leaning in the Battle of the Atlantic than they already were. The Royal Navy objected to this heavily, and did the same towards the idea of handing her over to a Yugoslav crew in the Mediterranean. The end result would be that U-570 was commissioned into the Royal Navy on October 5th, 1941, under the name HMS Graf, evidently with a name starting with G to represent her German origins, or to make a pun on the Graf, as in Graf Zeppelin, title. Because bad puns are by no means a modern invention. Assigned the pennant number P715, the newly renamed Graf set out on her second set of sea trials in February 1942. This would prove to be far more valuable than any codebooks could have been, as the British had already captured an Enigma machine and assorted books from U-110. But having a fully functional Type 7 allowed the Royal Navy to test each and every feature of the mainstay German submarine. They identified her safe diving depth as 230 meters, 750 feet, which was deeper than expected. Knowing this would allow for better counters, being as the Royal Navy had assumed it to be shallower. With the actual depth in hand, they could adjust the maximum depth setting on their depth charges to prevent U-boats from sailing deeper than the attackers could reach. That's just one thing, too. The British could test everything about the German design, from her equipment to her crew comfort. It was a wake-up call in a lot of ways, from how stealthy the submarine was to how her periscope and hydrophone equipment functioned. That last one was apparently considered to be substantially superior to British equivalents. Even the United States Navy observers were impressed. Or, at the least, impressed enough to consider her superior, in some aspects, to the closest American equivalent, the Mackerel class. The British even went so far as to construct full-size mock-ups of her crew compartments to train boarding parties. All of this testing would keep Graf occupied until October 8, 1942, when she was finally released from it. Now on a proper, active war patrol, she entered into her career as the only U-boat to serve the Royal Navy in actual combat. This career would not see much in the way of actual success, but the fact it happened at all 
is something of a success in its own right if you want to look at it that way. Her first patrol would take Graf down around the coast of France and Spain, where she would, unsuccessfully, make an attempt to sink one of her ex-comrades. On October 21st, 50 miles off the Spanish coast, Graf fired on U-333 with four torpedoes. The German submarine, caught on the surface, managed to spot the torpedoes and evade them. Thus did Graf miss her first chance at sinking a fellow German ship, though the crew aboard the captured U-boat were convinced they had hit her. Had they done so, Graf would have ended up sinking one of her own sister ships. Following this, Graf would go on her second war patrol on November 19, 1942. This patrol lasted until December 8th, and took her along much the same path as her first. It was even less eventful than the first, however, as Graf missed an Italian cargo ship she had been hunting. And by missed, I mean failed to even find her. It was her third war patrol, beginning on December 24th, that Graf had her best chance to really make some impact on the naval war. In her own right, instead of just by virtue of being used as a guinea pig. Sailing for the cold waters off Norway this time, Graf was joined by three other Royal Navy submarines. This was a fairly standard mission, other than involving the captured U-boat, and might have gone by without any real incident. As it turned out, while Graf once again failed at sinking anything, she had quite the chance during this patrol. At 1 a.m. on January 1, 1943, Graf spotted the cruiser Admiral Hipper. She was returning from the Battle of the Barren Sea, and would have made for quite the inviting target. One can already imagine the propaganda value of ex-German submarine sinks German heavy cruiser. It was not meant to be, though. Hipper was sailing too far away and too fast for Graf to catch up to. An attempt to fire upon two German destroyers similarly failed. Once more, four torpedoes were fired, and once more, they all failed to hit anything. While the British were, again, convinced they had sunk something. That said, when Graf returned to port on January 13th, it was to never again go to war. She switched over to training duties at this point, as spare parts began to become a real issue. Her batteries and diesel engines had a fairly short service life, and the British had no real way to replace them, short of cutting the submarine open and putting in British equivalents. Quite ignoring that this runs into an issue of space and mismatched parts, it frankly wasn't worth the effort. This is what any captured ship in the 20th century would run into, eventually. Parts compatibility and the increasing cost and effort required to keep something using foreign components in service. Being frank, Graf had served her purpose well, and the Royal Navy had no real reason to keep a one-off U-boat in active service. So it was that Graf was decommissioned on June 21st, 1943. After being used as a target for depth charges, the tired submarine was towed off for scrapping. But, in an image that Warspite would be proud of, Graf decided that she didn't want to be scrapped so easily. On March 20th, 1944, while under tow for scrapping, HMS Graf broke her tow line in strong winds. She was driven ashore by those winds, and similarly strong waves, on the Scottish coast. Unable to refloat the submarine, the British gave up and just left her on the rocks. HMS Graf remains there to this day, though she was partially salvaged in the 1960s. Apparently, she rests in about 5 meters, 20 feet of water, and can be visited by divers. Emphasis on can, because this is the Scottish coast, and you attempt that kind of dive at your own risk. So ends the story of HMS Graf, the only U-boat to see service with both Allied and Axis navies during the Second World War. It's a shame that service saw no successes on her own part, but the intelligence and technical coup of her capture cannot, and should not, be understated. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.